Yep. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the um, Further Change Point workshop. Uh, I'm Rebecca Killick. I'm Associate Professor of Statistics at Lancaster University, and um, I'm going to be giving the course today. So I'll just share the screen. In the chat, there is um, a link to um, the GitHub page. Um, let me just go back and I can show you for that. So let me share the GitHub page. So on this page here, the, this um, gives all of the files for the, for the workshop today. Uh, if you want to follow along with the slides, it's this further change point PDF. Uh, you can just click on that and then click download here on, on the right. And that'll give you the same slides that I'm using today. Um, and then if you want the um, code, oh, I've gone one too far. If you, if you want the code for all of those slides, that's in the R Markdown document here. Um, and um, if you want the A E Goldstone data, that's in this R data file here. Uh, if you use the RMD, you probably want to um, download the, the whole um, repository because because that contains all of the themes and everything and all of the extra some extra JPEGs and some simulation code um, that I'll be using today. So, um, yep, just to <clears throat> just to kind of say, um, if you want to follow along with the slides, it's the the PDF and the markdown and all of the other files are, are just to recreate that PDF. Okay. So if I go back and share the um, share the slides for today. So I'm hoping that every, everybody who has uh, who's attending today um, has attended the um, or at least watched the video for the uh, original change point workshop. Uh, if not, then you may want to bow out now because uh, um, I will be assuming that as um, as uh, assumed knowledge for today. So I will do a brief recap because it, it was um, a few weeks ago um, that um, the initial course was, um, or last year, if, if, you, if you came to last year, uh, uh, last year's initial workshop. Um, and so I will kind of do a brief recap at the start um, just so that we can all be on the same page today. So the plan for the workshop today, um, it's not, um, um, it's going to be following a similar style to the previous workshop, which is that we'll have some um, verbal kind of instruction around the topic, and then I'll um, set a task for, for you to do um, whilst um, we also have a, a short break. So um, during that, um, the amount of time allotted is really um, so that you can take a break from the screen, but also um, um, complete some of the activities um, at, at the same time. Or rather, go go and take a break, get yourself a brew, and then come back and, and do some of the, the activities. So I'll do a recap of the um, change point um, paradigm and you know what what would what um, regime we're working in. Then today I'm going to talk um, initially about checking assumptions. So in the previous workshop, I kind of told you how to do um, a lot of the change point analysis, but then we're kind of going into the how do you um, some more advanced topics now, which is around checking the assumptions um, of your modeling um, dealing with autocorrelation in your data, um, which I kind of flagged as a potential um, um, issue in, in the last course. Uh, I'm going to talk about multivariate change points uh, as well. Um, everything so far that I've spoken about is, is univariate, where you just have one time series. Um, multivariate change points is where you have more than one time series that you might want to uh, find change points in. And then I'm going to be talking about influence as well. <clears throat> uh, that's a kind of, I touched on it in last year's further change point course, but this year um, everything's on CRAN and it's all published. So I'm going to go into a bit more detail on some of those. And as with the other course, there'll be tasks through the sections to kind of get you to practice um, some of these techniques that, that we're looking at. Okay. So just a reminder, um, what am I talking about when I talk about change points? Um, so we're going to have um, a time series of data and um, by time series, it doesn't have to be indexed by time. It just has to be ordered in some way. So it could be across a genome or the majority that I come across in the NHS are ordered over some kind of time indexer. Um, uh, and 
the idea of a change point is that there will be at some time point during that um, time series where the statistical properties will change. Okay. So I've got three examples here. That we've got change in mean on the left, change in variance in the middle, and a trend on the right. And so in the initial course, we looked at how we can detect where these change points are in, in different types of series. And we looked at the mean and the variance and a mean and variance um, change. And um, today we'll kind of go on to trend changes and, and other types of changes um, as well. Okay. So just as a reminder, the, the way that these models work is that, is that we are basically just piecing together stationary models. So to get the change in mean, we piece together a, a, um, a model that has, um, for the first one, a mean at one, and then you piece that together with a, mean, with a um, model that has a mean at zero. So you're kind of chunking the data and, and you're assuming that with, between two change points that that data is independent of, of the other bit chunks of data. So really it's about um, how we decide where to chunk that data. And in, in this course as well, we're going to talk about, well, what model should we be using for, for these types of data as well? Okay. So is anybody unclear about where, you know, the recap of what we're talking about today? I'll try and monitor the, the chat as well. Okay. Don't say anything, so I'll move on. Feel free to interrupt at any point as, as we go through, um, but just note that we are recording. So today we're going to use um, these four different packages. So the change point package is one that we used um, in the introduction. Um, we're going to use three additional packages, MCPT. Um, it's called MCPT because it was originally um, designed for environmental data, but the same techniques can be used um, across all applications. Um, but it was just motivated by um, an environmental one. Um, and that's going to help us with our model choice and the autocorrelation. Um, then the change point influence, that's going to be um, in the influence section. That's the, the new package. And then change point geo is, is going to do some of our multivariate change points. Um, just to kind of note, there are lots of other R packages available, not just the ones I'm talking about today. Um, EZP um, does univariate and multivariate non-parametric using energy statistics. Inspect change point does multivariate changes in mean. Uh, HD Binseg does multivariate um, changes using a double QSUM test statistic. Um, Bayes Project um, also does multivariate change points. So just to say, obviously, there are other things other than what I'm just talking about today. Okay. So... If we think back to how we're fitting these models, so we, we have a, um, a time series and we're chunking that up into lots of different smaller, smaller chunks. So the problem that we have with checking our assumptions is that we can't really do these and um, do the assumption check uh, prior to fitting our data. OK, so if you think about it, you, you might say, OK, I I suspect or would like to model my data using a normal distribution um, with a change in mean, for example. And so in doing that, what I'm assuming is that um, my data are in independent, there's no correlation between them. I'm assuming that I have normally distributed data or the errors from my uh, modeling process are normally distributed. And I'm assuming that I have a constant variance across my data as well. So the question then becomes, well, how can I actually check these? And if you think about it, if you, if you don't know where the change points are, then there's no way that you can check these a priori. Because if you did, for example, um, a standard um, check for normality, uh, if you have data with different mean, uh, points where the mean is different across the different points, that's actually going to be a mixture of normal distributions because you've got one mean for the first bit, and then when you go um, between the change points, you've got a different mean. So that, that ends up being a mixture of normal distributions. And so if you just um, take a standard change point process and do a check for normality, um, if you do have changes within your data, then you should uh, um, reject the, the null saying, saying that it is normally distributed data. So that means that um, it's very, very challenging for us to assess these assumptions a priori. 
and a lot of that comes from the fact that we need to know where the change points are to be able to um, actually uh, check um, our assumptions are valid. So how do we actually do this? So the way that I'm, I advocate to check these assumptions is to check your residuals. So you can't do this um, pre-analysis, but post-analysis you can check whether, whether the assumptions that you made during the analysis were reasonable or not. Um, so the first thing to do um, is to look at the residuals um, because we're assuming that those residuals are normally distributed with a constant variance um, and that they're independent. So if we, if we just look at one example here, so I've set my seed just so you, that you can reproduce it. I've got a change in mean here going from a mean of, of zero to a mean of five. Um, and if I just do cpt.mean, which is what we did in the last course, that will find me a single change point uh, in the mean. Uh, and that's just, um, I'm gonna call it m1.amoc because that's a single change point. To get the estimate of those parameters, I can use the param.est function. And that's what we did in, in the last course. And it's a mean that I want to get. So I'm going to use the dollar mean to, to get the mean part of that list. Okay. And this is the mean for each individual segment. So what I can do is I can repeat that mean um, for each of the segment lengths. So seg.len, if you recall from, from the last course, uh, gets these the lengths of the segments. So that's the number of observations between each change point. So what all I'm doing here is I'm taking the mean vector here, which is approximately, um, you know, th these means here should be approximately zero and approximately five if the change points um, are is in the correct place. And so this means here is going to be a, a two length vector. And then when I get seg dot length here, this is also a two length vector. And so by default, this rep function will repeat uh, the first mean, uh, the first segment length number of times, and the second mean the second segment length number of times. So I'll get a, a vector here, which is the mean at every single time point uh, in my data. Okay. So then to take the residuals, I just take my original data and I remove the mean structure. And what we're saying is that should be normally distributed um, with a constant mean of zero and a, a constant variance um, across the series. So then now I've, I've got rid of my change points, got rid of the effect of the change points on, on the mean structure. I can then just do a standard normality test because now I, I'm saying that, that they're no longer a mixture of normal distributions. I've, I've normalized um, from that. So I can do a, um, a standard, um, whatever normality test you want. I've done a Shapiro test here. Um, and this comes out um, with a p-value that is larger than 0.05. So we say we do not reject um, the hypothesis of normality here. If you don't like the shapiro wilkes you can do a, a Kamogros-Smirnov test um, or any other test that you want. So again, I'm looking at the residuals here um, um, and just using the normal distribution here with the mean being the mean of the residuals, you could also replace that with zero because that's kind of the assumption that we're making and then the standard deviation. And again, that p-value is larger than 0.05, so, um, or whatever bound you want to use. So we say that we do not reject the assumption that um, the residuals come from this distribution here, which is um, a normal distribution with the mean and variance of the residuals. So that's quite easy to do in, in, the, um, in the mean change setting. Obviously, for some of the more complicated um, models that we might be fitting, it might not be as easy to get the residuals. So the other thing that we can do is, is we can look, um, if you don't like using a normality tests, then you can just do a, a QQ plot. So again, um, just looking at the QQ of the residuals here, and you can see, as, as is always the case when you look at QQ plots, it's not perfectly on the line, especially in the tails, but that's pretty good um, um, from, from a uh, randomization point of view. And so we, we would probably say that we were happy that that was normally distributed or reasonable to assume that. So that's kind of the, the residual check that, that we're looking at. That's for normality. So now let's look at the autocorrelation so if we look at the autocorrelation function, again, of our residuals, 
um, then we'll see here that um, they are uncorrelated. This first one here is, is the variance being at one. Um, then you've got the uncorrelated um, um, at all of the lags here. Okay, so we're normally looking for, for these roughly within the blue lines. If you get a couple out, um, that's okay, because that's kind of a 95% confidence interval here for no structure at those lags. So that, that's kind of a way that we can check those residuals. I, I now just want to talk to you about, well, what is the effect of breaking some of those? Okay. Um, a standard one that's typically broken in um, the majority of, of data that I come across um, is autocorrelation. And I just want to kind of give you a pre-warning here about the dangers of autocorrelation on change point analyses. So, if you think about it, if we if we just have this um, um, data here, where we've again got a change in mean from a mean of zero here to, to a mean of three, um, very obvious here um, about the, the change point location, and you can use um, um, the standard, I'm, I'm using mean and variance here, but I, I didn't need to, um, method here for, um, assessing where the change points are. I've, I've again used the, the PELT method that we spoke about in the last course. So just a, a naive plot here, and um, you, you would probably look at that and you say, yep, that's pretty good. So what happens now if we add correlation to, to that? So this is exactly the same simulation here. We're going from a mean of zero to a mean of um, three, uh, but now I've added autocorrelation. So I was going to say a mean of zero to a mean three. No, this is a mean of zero to a mean of one. Um, and I'm adding autocorrelation here. So I've got autocorrelation is, is very strongly positive, uh, 0.9. Um, I've just modified the sigma squared so that it's still equal to one here. Um, the um, residual variance. Um, and then I'm just doing exactly the same as I was before, just plotting um, the mean variance. Okay, and you'll know I'm using the, the same seed at the top here. Okay, but now I've got an, an AR1 process. And so it, it's really obvious that we have that, that large change in mean going on uh, in this data, but we also get lots of other change points. And these change points are not due to any change in the underlying mean of the process, they're purely down to the autocorrelation. So if you think about what a strong positive autocorrelation means, um, that means that my um, at lag one, my observation that I'm going to observe now is highly correlated to the observation that I've just observed. So that creates runs in your data. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. You've kind of got a run going uh, positive and then you've got a run going negative. And then you've got, um, and that's what creates the false change points um, when we assume that there is no, um, that the data points are independent. So if we have strong positive autocorrelation and we assume the data points are independent, then we're going to get um, additional change points within our data. Now, there are some ways that we can mitigate this. One is to um, modify our penalty value. So the reason why we um, see the additional change points is because our penalty is set too low. Um, so asymptotically, we're going to find more change points than we otherwise would do due to the autocorrelation. So one way that you can mitigate this is you can take whatever penalty you want to use and divide it by the autocorrelation in the data. But then again, how do we estimate that autocorrelation when we, um, when we don't know where the change points are? Because if I just estimated the autocorrelation in this data, it, the estimate would be incorrect due to that change in mean structure that we're seeing. Okay. So it can be challenging to do that correction, but it's, it's something that is, is possible um, if you have an idea of what the autocorrelation is, or you can do an iterative approach whereby you kind of fit with a very high penalty and then you can kind of change um, that. Or we do have a new paper that uh, looks at differences to be able to um, look at the difference data and get a, a um, get an asymptotically consistent estimator of the autocorrelation, uh, but using the difference data where the change points just occur as outliers. 
uh, so the changes in mean occur as outliers. Okay. So that's positive autocorrelation. What about if we look at negative autocorrelation? So exactly the same simulation here, but what I'm doing now is I'm just using a negative 0.9 instead of a positive 0.9. Okay. And so this um, it has the opposite effect. So despite having a change in mean, again at 100, which you can just about see if you if you kind of know it's there, um, instead of us being able to see that, where it was obvious here, and uh, that's a change in mean of three, but uh, it was obvious here, but it's it's not as obvious here. Okay. And so what the negative autocorrelation is doing is it's saying that um, whatever my observation is now, it's going to be negatively correlated with my previous observation. So that gets you the very um, kind of um, more wiggly where you've, you know, you've got a positive followed by a negative, et cetera. Um, so if you've got an observation above the mean, your next one is, is likely to be below the mean. Um, so that's what that behavior is here. So exactly the same series, just one with positive autocorrelation and one with negative autocorrelation. Now, in the majority of real-world scenarios, we're dealing with positive autocorrelation, but there are some where, where I have actually seen negative autocorrelation come through. Um, a lot of it in um, things like where you're dealing with people and if somebody's just done something, then they're definitely not going to do it, or they're, they're less likely to do it again at the next time step. Um, that can produce uh, negative autocorrelation coming through. So here we've estimated one change point, but it's clearly in the wrong place. So again, we can do a correction dividing by the um, autocorrelation and, and that will um, allow us to see that change point more clearly um, than we otherwise would have done. So I'm gonna set an exercise now. We've been going for about 20 minutes or so. So within the change point package, there's um, this data called uh, lay 2005 figure four. So it's um, some um, ge um, genomics data here. And so um, this data is um, uh, contains a change in mean. So I've kind of put our, um, how you can access that data here. So if you do library change point, and then you do data and um, to get uh, lay 2005 fig four and then you can just fit the the mean structure just doing uh, cpt mean um, i've done method as pelt but but it will um, just identify one change point point. Um, and then i'd like i'd really like you to um just fit um that process as as i've got there on the slide and then i'd like you to look at the residuals and just check um are the assumptions of our modeling reasonable here so recall the CPT mean has uh, assumes a, a constant variance. It assumes a normally distributed error structure and it assumes independence. So I'm going to let you um, have uh, 15 minutes now. So we'll come back at 10 past um, and just um, I'd really like to hear what you guys find. Okay, I'm going to just assume that everybody went for a cup of tea then. <laughs> um, so if you look at it, you'll, you'll see that um, um, if you look at the residuals, then they do look to be reasonably um, normally distributed, although the constant variance across the, the series um, is questionable at that, at that point. So we may want to look at the mean and variance change rather than just a mean change for that type of data. 
Okay, so so let's um, move on now. So we've kind of looked about how we can check our assumptions for our modeling. What happens if we find that the some of the assumptions might be invalid? So maybe it's not um, independent, or maybe the um, mean of the residuals is not constant, um, as, as we might be expecting, or, or the residuals are not normally distributed. So <clears throat> one thing that we can then do is we can say, OK, well, if, for example, there is autocorrelation in, in the residuals, then there's two options. One is, as I said, you can modify the penalty to take account of that. The other one is you can actually model that autocorrelation. So you can go back to the drawing board, kind of go um, back to the beginning of the process and say, what model should I be fitting for this um, data? I know it's got a change point. It might be a change in mean. Um, but maybe I need to have um, correlated errors in that. OK. So to kind of help you in, in this decision making process, um, the MCPT package automatically fits 12 different models to your data and will allow you to look at each of those fits and, and will suggest um, the best uh, model out of the ones that it has chosen. So one of the key things that, that we were looking at is um, when we developed this package is that when we potentially have hundreds or, or even thousands of, of time series, we, we cannot physically look at every single one of them and say, oh, I think this one is a, is a flat mean um, with a change point um, and it's got autocorrelation. So I'm going, that's the model I'm going to fit. Oh, this other um, series that I have has a trend in it and maybe it doesn't have any uh, change points, but it does have autocorrelation. So this um, package kind of arose because of, of the, the need in the environmental sciences to analyze hundreds or potentially thousands of, of data sets. And so the types of models that are considered are the ones that we typically come across um, in the environmental sciences literature, but they're also the ones that we typically come across um, in health literature as well. So the, the types of um, models that are fit are just a flat mean structure. So it's just a, a normal distribution with, with just a, a flat mean. And um, we have just the flat mean with AR1 and AR2 um, errors. We have a flat mean with a change point. And then we have a flat mean with uh, a change point with AR1 errors and a change point with AR2 errors. And then we have all of those again, but instead of being for a flat mean with, with a trend. And the trend that's automatically put into this um, um, paradigm here, you don't need to specify the type of trend or rather you cannot in, in the um, model structure is that the trend is um, a linear trend on the observation order. So you can modify that by putting in, for example, the year or the year month um, index. But to, if you don't supply um, a kind of dates for your observations, then it will just assume um, a linear trend across a known indexing. OK, so what I mean here by AR1 is I mean autoregressive model of order one. So that basically means that my, my current observation yt is a function of uh, my previous data point yt minus one, um, as we were kind of looking earlier, it's it's maybe it's 0 0.9 times yt minus one or something, but that that um, coefficient there is estimated as part of the modeling process plus some error structure. Okay. So the bonus with MCPT is that you can do this automatically across hundreds or, or thousands of different models. Um, uh, sorry, different data sets, and it can tell you which model is the best for each individual one. Uh, as, with that, as with all these sorts of things, the, the way that you decide which model is the best uh, is always the crunch point here. Uh, so we advocate, based on simulations, to use the Schwartz information criterion, or, or the Bayes, also known as the Bayesian information criterion. They're exactly the same. And so you can just do a BIC on the output from MCPT, and it can tell you which uh, is the best. So the downside with this is obviously, if you are doing this for a large set of data, then, and you physically cannot check uh, every single one, you may have, for example, some seasonality structure in some of your time series, and maybe not the ones that you, you've done a cherry pick off just to check at the beginning. Um, and so 
you can end up fitting inappropriate models to data because um, you are not looking at, at all of them. And obviously these we need to, to kind of have some practical well, ways of dealing with these challenges of having to fit things automatically to thousands of time series. But at the same time, we also, it goes kind of against um, the, all the training that, that kind of says, you need to look at your data and make sure that the model that you're fitting is appropriate for the data. So um, just as a, as a caveat there, the model that is appropriate for the data may not be within that set of models that are fit. And so the best, as it comes out with maybe meaningless um, if it's if there isn't an appropriate one there to choose. Okay. So let me show you an example of how it actually works. Um, so here again, I'm setting the seed. I've just got that same process that I had before where I've got a mean of zero to a mean of one um, with my positive autocorrelation at 0.9 here. And all I need to do is do MCPT of uh, my data and that will automatically fit it. The change point models that are fit here are changes in mean and variance um, or as, as appropriately with AR1 or AR2 error structure or with a trend um, in there. Um, and they're all fit using the PELT function um, with the MBIC penalty auto as, as a, um, a default option. So you can change that, you can add in arguments here, but, but that's what's automatic clear. Um, you can also, if you say, for example, you don't want to allow trends or you want to force trends in, in your um, model selection here, you can select a subset of those 12 models to fit um, using the, the naming structure that, that's in the help file. So if we then fit, um, um, if we use MCPT on this data X here, um, then it will automatically by default fit 12 different models. Uh, it does have, if, if this data is quite long, obviously, um, fitting 12 models could be um, time consuming. So it does have um, as what kind of this is the starting point here. Uh, it does have a kind of a tracker to, so you can see how far through fitting those models it is. And then, as I said, you can use the BIC to, um, to calculate the penalized score for each of these different um, uh, models that we're fitting, because obviously they've all got different numbers of parameters. And with the change points in there, there's obviously different um, uh, hugely different, potentially hugely different number of parameters between the change point models and the non-change point models. So we do need a way of uh, penalizing that. So we use the, the BIC here. So just do BIC on the output from the MCPT. That will get me the BIC scores for each of the individual models. And then I can use which.min on that to get which one is going to be the best. Okay. And for this, it's the mean AR1 CPT, uh, that's the naming at the top, and it tells you which um, um, index that, that occurs at within this uh, BIC out. So it's in index five. Okay. And so that's good because what, what did we simulate? We simulated a change in mean here from a mean of zero to one with AR1 autocorrelated errors. So that's given us the model that we actually fit in the first place, which is good. Okay. So what if we wanted to actually, you know, visualize these things? So by default, the plotting on the whole object will give you um, some diagnostics. So the first diagnostic plot is um, a kind of a plot of all of the different models that are fit. So obviously the data is at the bottom here. We, we have our change in mean that, um, that is at 100. And um, because it's um, uh, autocorrelation here and it's heavy uh, 0.9, that kind of appears more as a slope um, here than it would do um, in the traditional change point model because um, the slope um, is induced by the positive autocorrelation. So it kind of, it jumps up, but then it kind of keeps um, jumping based on, on the mean of, of the previous observation. So all of these models here um, are the, the ones that were fitted. Obviously, there's no kind of, it's all relative because there's no real scale here. They're all plotted, uh, basically, these are all plotted on a one high scale, so they're all relative uh, to each other. Um, but it can give you an indication, for example, this trend CPT uh, part here. These vertical lines that, that you're seeing um, in this plot are the locations of the change points where um, 
the changes in trend are identified. And you can see here that when we um, don't include the autocorrelation, uh, just a reminder, this is just a flat mean structure. There should be no trend whatsoever. Um, but we're clearly fitting an incorrect model here. But when we do, you can clearly see that the, um, uh, the autocorrelation, those runs, is inducing more change points um, in the data. Okay. And again, with the mean change point um, that we've got here, um, this is um, because of the autocorrelation, we're getting more change points than we otherwise uh, would have done. Because even though it is a flat mean structure, um, the change points are inducing, uh, sorry, the autocorrelation is inducing additional change points because it's, it's positive autocorrelation here. Okay. So you can see that the mean CPTA01, which is the, the correct model here, just picks one um, change point, and, and that is at 100, so at the start of that, of that slope, because it, it understands that that slope is due to the autocorrelation. Um, the stars that, that are occurring on these models, the stars will only occur on a change point model if there's no change points. So you'll see this is trend CPT, but there are no vertical lines here. And so this gives, this tells me that there's no change points if I fit that model. Apologies, if I fit that model. And so the stars are just kind of a visual represent, a clear kind of indication in, in the um, plotting that that is the case. Um, so you'll get exactly the same model with the trend CPT AR2 as you would with the trend AR2 here. That's exactly the same model that's fit because no change points were identified. Okay. okay. And we've by default kind of coded in that if there are no change points, then when you do that witch.min, it will come out as the no change point process rather than being identified as the, the change point process, even though um, the values that it gives out are identical. So we've kind of coded that in. Okay. So the other thing that you can do with MCPT is, is everything that you would normally do in with a change point object. So we can use CPTS on it because the, um, the output is a CPT object. Ooh, sorry. Um, and so the way that we access it is we just use, um, so this out here contains uh, summary information in the first um, um, part and oh, just need to turn my um, power on. Uh, summary information in the first part and then a list of all of the different models that is fit. So even if a model doesn't come out as the best, you can still inspect it. Um, and see, see what would have been fit. And you can use the names of the model structure or their places um, as um, ways to access that uh, model fit. So this out uh, mean AR1 CPT is a change point object, uh, sorry, a CPT object, just like the change point package produced as previously. And so therefore we can use things like uh, CPTS on it. So that'll get our change point out. And um, this is also, um, what we can do if we don't want to kind of use this um, naming structure here, what we can do here is we can use um, the positioning. So I'm getting which one's the minimum here. I have to add one here because the first is my summary information. So I have to add one to get that. And so that plots here, this uh, data structure, uh, this uh, plotting here, and, and then uh, I can just add the change points on as a vertical line. Uh, which is what I've done in the second part. So notice that when I plot it, um, I'm plotting here, this isn't just the mean structure, this is the mean plus AR1 structure. And um, so that kind of shows you how it, it follows um, the data rather than this plot being um, just the, the flat mean either side. Um, okay. That kind of came from, again, the environmental scientists who did not like the um, flat mean plotting. Okay, so now again, um, we've had another uh, 20 minutes or so. So um, I've got another task for you. So um, this is some um, a &E data um, on the monthly proportion of uh, admissions for gallstone um, disease between January 2010 and December 2019. So the data is in, sorry, the data is in the GitHub repository that I, I showed earlier and that's been shared in the chat. 
So if you download that data, you can just do a load uh, on that R data process here. And then this is just how you can plot the data. So two here, the index two, this is, this is just the observations. Index one is the date of the observations um, being taken uh, when they were taken. So we can, we can just do a plot here of the observations. And what I'd like you to do is um, use the MCPT package to see if there is any evidence um, for changes in this and what is the best model that, that is fit to this data. Um, and please be prepared to come back and um, discuss what, what, what you found. Okay, so I'll give you um, another, um, let's say 10 minutes to do that. So we'll come back at uh, 10.40. Did anybody have a chance to, to look at this? What did you find? Feel free to unmute and say, or, or type in the chat if you want. What did you find? What was the best model here? Were there any change points? Hi, hi Rebecca. <laughs> um, Yay, someone's talking to me. Yeah, yeah, I thought I'm feeling sorry for you. So I'll talk to you. <laughs> I think I got somewhere. Um I got trend AR1 as the best fit for me. That's great. Um you're you're in good company. A few people in the chat also got okay. trend AR1, that's good. And and they also said um ah, somebody said that trend change point AR1 looked like the best model fit. But the minimum BIC gives trend. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Also gives trend AO one change points. So that's good. Um, so th let's take a look um, together. So if we kind of do the A E Gallstone on the second, um, the the second column. So that's just the the data that we're looking at. And I also got trend AO one CPT. If we if we look at the BIC um, as as the option here. So let's have a look what, what they kind of look like in, in a general sense. So again, I mean, hopefully you can see from the original data here that a flat mean structure just doesn't look appropriate here. Uh, if we were going to look at the data, you would be guessing that there would be some form of trend going on here. Um, if the trend was purely due to um, the or, uh, any autocorrelation, then, you know, that there would be a lot more... Um, you wouldn't expect a, a run as long as this one um, from, from just autocorrelation. So the, the trend coming through is, is um, something that um, we're kind of expecting to see. What is interesting from my point of view is, is when you're looking at the mean change point processes, basically all of that trend is, is getting mocked up by the AR1 or the AR2 process. And so you don't actually see the change points. Um, whereas when you're not including that autocorrelation structure, then you get quite a few change points here. And you'll notice that for, for the first few where, where you've kind of got the increasing trend within the data, you're, you're getting what we call a, a staircase. So every, every time, basically, it just breaks the slope down into lots of flat increasing um, mean structures. So if you see any of these type staircases uh, when you're looking at your data, you might want to be thinking about adding a trend and seeing if the trend model might be a better fit to, to your data set. But the interesting thing is that when you include autocorrelation, um, the autocorrelation can kind of mop up a lot, of, a lot of that trend structure because you're saying my observation now is highly dependent on the previous one and it will put a very heavy um, positive autocorrelation here to mop up that trend structure. Um, and so that's what's going on here as to why we've got when a mean change point where we've got quite a few, but then when we add in the AR1 and the AR2 structure, we suddenly get no change points. So that's kind of also a, a good indication when, when you're looking at this sort of thing. So the trend uh, AR1 change point came out as the best, and that has a single change point kind of over here. 
um, around kind of observation uh, 90 or so. So if we kind of look back, that, that's basically this break that, that we're seeing here. So you can imagine just fitting a, a flat tread, uh, trend line um, up to this point, and then we've got a break here, and then, and then you've got another different trend line going after that. So that's really what's going on. But this plot can kind of give you an idea um, around the different models and, and where the change points might be in the different models. Um, the trend AR2 here, the extra parameter for the AR2 is kind of, you know, mopping up some, some of what's going on with this um, change point here. So it basically doesn't get over the threshold to, to put that change point in, but that's also not the, the best model that's coming out. So it's both it's basically saying instead of putting in that extra parameter for the AR2, you're much better putting in the, the change point process and having a few more parameters and different models either side um, coming through there, which is interesting. So we can kind of have a look at that. So here I'm looking at the, the change points for the trend AR1 change point uh, model that was fit. Uh, so again, that comes out as, as just a CPT object. So you can just do CPTS around that. And then I'm looking in the date column here. I've just named it rather than using column one. Um, so I'm using the date um, column in the original data set here just to get when that was, okay, rather than just the observation number. So that was in 2017. Um, and I'm told that that was due to a, um, a difference in the classification of what constituted um, the Goldstone presentation um, from the um, database. So basically there, there was a reshuffling in the codes and, and that produced a drop in the um, number of um, number of admiss admittances in A&E that were categorized as um, the gallstone because uh, different categories were added. And so therefore that produced a drop in the proportion of um, A&E admissions that were due to that specific code. And then I can plot that um, as the change point structure coming out. And then you can see this, this break here around, um, kind of around just before 90 observations here. Okay, good. So there's another exercise here that I'm not going to ask you to do now, um, but feel free to do later, kind of go back to that um, lie data that we were looking at and again, using M MCPT and seeing if that fits with, with what we looked at previously. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about influence now. So we've, we've kind of seen in this how the model that we pick can influence where the change points are um, and whether there are any change points and going with a, a simpler model may give you more or less change points um, than a more complicated model. But how does the data that we observe itself influence um, what change points we get out? For example, um, when we have um, kind of outlying or unusual observations with that within our data set, sometimes they can be identified as change points um, themselves. So you'll kind of get two change points, one either side of maybe an additive outlier. Um, but how do, how do kind of strange but maybe not outlying observations um, affect uh, where the change points are. And so the other kind of setting that we're looking at is, well, people will often ask me around, well, what's my, um, you know, my p-value for a specific change point? And when, and when you're looking at multiple change points, that doesn't really make sense because when you remove one change point, especially in the PELT framework, um, the other change points can move. And so how do you quantify the kind of the p-value for one specific uh, change point um, uh, location is, is a lot more challenging than it may first seem. So I prefer to kind of think about this from an influence perspective. And, you know, if, I, if my data were slightly different, would I obtain the exact same segmentation? So this is kind of looking at um, from an influence perspective. So if you're used to influence from a um, regression point of view, the interpretation there is kind of, well, how, how much influence does the observation, does a specific observation have on my regression line that I'm fitting? So you can think about it in a similar way in the change point context of how does this one specific observation influence whether there is change points 
or not in my data. Okay. And I also like to think about this around stability of if my data is slightly different, do my change points disappear completely? Do they move slightly? Do, do they kind of stay the same or, or do they do something that I might expect them to do um, with, within all of this? So this is kind of linked to the um, assumptions because if our assumptions are fully satisfied, then um, in the sense that everything um, is um, statistically valid, um, then this question kind of can, I mean, it's, it still arises because you can still get observations that are in the extremes of a distribution, um, but it's, it's less of a problem. Whereas I, I find influence is, is a lot more interesting when we're looking at real world data that maybe violates some of our assumptions. So let me kind of just have a running example through this to kind of get um, give you some intuition as to what I mean by this. So I'm going to use this example here. Uh, this is from uh, the example that's used in, in our paper that's just been published in uh, Journal of Computational and Graphical Statistics. And it just gives you um, a flavor of the sorts of things that can happen. So we have a large change at the beginning, which we'd like to think would be stable, You know, even if we see some extremes from both of these distributions at the, the or near the change point location, the change point is kind of larger than the um, um, kind of variance that you might see within the distributions either side of it. And so we, we would like to think that that change point would be obvious regardless of the, the data that we see either side. The one on the, on the right, um, there, that smaller change point, um, that is less so. So if we see, um, for example, if, if the um, low point just before that right change point um, um, around here, if you can see, if you can see my mouse kind of just before 150, um, if that would have been a little bit further on, then that would appear as if it's from the distribution after the change point. And so that that is kind of what I mean by um, influence in some ways where observations can overlap. So the, the means so the means of these two distributions, normal distributions either side, are different, but their the their distributions in in themselves have some overlap. And then right in the middle at time point 100, I've put an additive outlier. So that means I have one observation that is clearly um, different from what um, I have ob observed either side. And so a lot of times people will want to identify these outliers and, and have the see the effect that they have on the um, observed data and the model that we're kind of fitting to the data. Okay, so this is just using, I'm just using the cpt.mean function here uh, with Pelt. Um, and um, we have, so technically speaking here, we have uh, one, two, three, four change points because this outlier that's in the middle has a change point either side of it. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of take some inspiration from these um, regression analyses and, and robust statistics where we're talking about influence functions. And I'm going to propose two ways to um, measure influence um, in a change point context. So the first being what happens if I modify an observation and that kind of gives it the most influence. I'm gonna make an observation an outlier that's gonna give it the most influence possible on the change point segmentation. And then the other way is the opposite, the least um, influence and you get the least influence by removing that observation completely. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two different things here. What happens if I make it the most influential uh, by putting it in its own segment, giving it two change points one either side, and what happens if I delete that observation completely? Okay, so just to kind of um, give you an idea um, here. So what happens? So if we have a, just a, a standard um, graphic here. A standard um, time series where it has a change in mean. Um, if we um, take this as our original data, this top left graph here, if we look at the segmentation, then we get the top right graph where we just get one change point um, just at 100. It, what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify my data 
by making a point an outlier. And so that's what I've done at time point 50 in the bottom left graph. I've just made time point 50 an outlier. And you can clearly see that as being very different from the rest of the data around it. And then in the bottom right, what I expect to happen is that I will get a change point either side of that uh, observation that I've made an outlier. So I'm putting it in its own segment. And we have some, um, uh, there was some theory in published in JATA around um, when we expect this to happen. Uh, that was by Paul Fernhead and Guillaume Regal. And um, so this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do this at every single location. Okay. So 200 time points here. So at every single location separately, I'm going to make them an outlier and see what happens to my segmentation. And if my segmentation is stable, I expect the change point to be identified correctly as it was in the original segmentation every time I make an outlier. I know I'll get two extra, two extra change points coming in because I've made an outlier, but I expect the, the original change points that I observed in the original series to stay the same. Okay. So what I can then do is once I've done this, I can then look at, well, what happens? So let's go back to our original example here. So there's um, the influence function um, inside uh, changepoint.influence package. And we just put in our original segmentation here. So this is um, my CPT object. So all I have to do, the CPT object uh, that comes out from um, this here. So I'm just using XCPT. So because I've used this CPT mean, the great thing about this um, uh, XCPT um, object here is it's a CPT class. So the CPT class contains everything needed to be able to replicate the analysis. So that's why uh, it's simplified here. I just need to give it that because I can reuse all of the parameters that are already contained within this object here to basically delete an observation, rerun the algorithm, uh, et cetera. And so I just put method equals outlier because what I'm doing to every single time point is I'm making it an outlier. Okay. Then my first level of graphic to assess how stable my solution is, uh, is this stability overview. And the stability overview is literally a plot of the original data, as, as you can see below. And it just colors the and, and puts different line types for the different types of things that we observe. So if our original observation is already in its own segment, then when I make it further more an outlier, then it will still remain in its own segment. And that by definition is an outlier because they were already in their own segment and they're still in their own segment when I make it an outlier. Therefore, um, that original data point is an outlier. So I can use this to label these um, as outlier points. Then I have what I expect that this first change point here is stable, regardless of how I make outliers around it, it stays the same. And then this um, unstable change point here on the right hand side, the smaller change, depending on where I make outliers near it, that change point will either disappear or move. Okay. So green just means that it's exactly the same as it was in the original all the way through. Uh, outliers are exactly the same, they're exactly the same all the way through, um, but they've been labeled as outliers because um, they are already in their own segment. And then the unstable ones are the ones that have um, either been deleted or moved at some point across um, making all of these points outliers. Okay. So for this year, um, we just need um, the original data for the, um, for the plotting, the, the change points, um, the original change points here, which come with the CPTS, and then this x.inf.out, which is my influence function um, here. Um, I've put in all of these extra bits here. This, this is just because I wanted my legend here um, to be in the top right and to um, be vertically stacked. Um, so if, if you don't need that um, for the graphic, then you don't need all of those options there. It's just the data, the change points, and your influence coming through. So that's the stability dashboard. Then we can actually have a look and say, well, 
now, now I've I've got this and I know that some are stable and some are unstable, I might want to look into, well, how unstable is, is this change point here, uh, the orange one? Um, and so with that, I can look at the location stability. So this basically says at every time point that would be a potential change point, so that's all of the observations across the bottom, um, what happened? And so this is the difference from expected. So when I make an observation in outlier, I expect to get a change point either side. So I, I kind of remove that effect and we're looking at the residuals here. So what this shows is that um, I got a new change point location here. That's the black vertical line. So that basically, um, if everything's okay, you shouldn't see anything here. It should just all just be zero. Um, but I've got a vertical black line here um, approximately six or seven times. And this is because this is a new change point location. So I did not expect to see a change point at this location here, but that has occurred across all of the 200 times that I've done it when I made an outlier at time point one, at time point two, at time point three, et cetera. Um, six or seven times I got a change point at this location where I was not expecting one. So any positives here are the addition of new change point locations. And then the negatives here are the times when a change point has disappeared. Okay, So this um, orange um, dot dash line here, this is my original change point location. So across the bottom in the negative um, space will only be true change point locations. And the positive space will be your additional change point locations. The negatives are the um, anything that's happened to your true change point locations. So what we can see here is that it's kind of around 27 or 28 times, that change point didn't occur at all, okay? So in my opinion, out of 200, 27 and 28 times for that to disappear is, is quite a lot. So that tells me that I should not put as much um, emphasis on, on inference for this change point location, because if my data was slightly different, I wouldn't see that change point location at all, okay? So that's kind of how I interpret these, the, this graph with the location stability. Again, um, we just put it in with the change points and the influence. Um, this type equals difference here is because there's, there's three different types. One is um, a global picture where it just gives you a histogram of how many times the change points occurred at each of the different locations. Um, again, what versus what we expected to see. Then there's a that's the global view, and then there's a local view, which is kind of um, a bit similar. Well, it's it's the same as that, but removes the actual change point locations. And then this is the difference one, um, which uh, we put in based on some reviewers' comments, and and I actually really like. Um, so that's why I've put that uh, today. So then you might think, okay, well, yes, this gets deleted, you know, twenty seven or twenty eight times, but actually. Is, is that really affecting me? Maybe I don't want to make inference on the actual change point location itself. Maybe, maybe I just want to um, have a look and um, make some inference from um, the mean structure, for example. So what we can do now is, is instead of looking at the change point locations for this stability, we can look at this um, parameter stability. So this is the mean structure and the red is the original mean that we estimated. OK, and then for each of the different times where we have um, taken a change point and uh, sorry, taken an observation and made it an outlier, that will give us uh, we've done that 200 times because there was 200 data points. And so for every single time that we've done that, we have the mean for each of the um, observations. So from, from the change point fit, just like we have the red mean from the original one. So all I've done here is, is I've plotted those um, those 200 different, so every, every time point from time point one to time point 200, we have 200 um, different means that have been estimated. And so what we're doing here is, is we're plotting those with um, a light shading. And so um, where it doesn't change very much over time, you've got lots of light shadings on top of each other and therefore it appears very dark. Um, but where it does change, so for example, at the beginning of the data, you can see a, a light gray at the bottom. And um, that's because 
when you put an outlier just after that data point, um, the mean for the first few data points is, is very low. Um, and this is why a lot of the, what I kind of say is bleeding that's coming out here is, is often towards the edges of the um, segments. And that's because when you make an outlier, you're then naturally making a shorter segment afterwards. And so that shorter segment um, has less observations in it from which to um, adequately estimate the mean. And so therefore it's more pulled away by individual observations, which is why you're getting this kind of bleeding effect coming through. What's interesting um, is this kind of blob just before 150, where you've got a blob of higher mean structure. And so that's coming through from these change from these additional change point locations here. So when you've got a change point, additional change point just before 500, then you've got these observations here that have a higher mean than they otherwise would have done. And similarly, just before you've got that uh, bar of lower mean structure, and that's coming through from, from that moved change point. So when you move the change point um, to, to the left, you obviously get um, a lower mean structure there. Um, and when, it, when that change point disappears, you also get that little bleed off to the right as well. So that kind of tells me a little bit more about the uncertainty of the mean structure around that location, um, depending on you know, where the change point is, whether it exists or not, um, as we found from making each individual point an outlier. So that's that's kind of gives you an insight into into the mean part. Um, but the other question that you might want to, to ask is, OK, well, I've got these observations here where I get a change point where I didn't previously. And I've got these 27 or 8 observations where I delete a change point. But when do they happen? What out, what points do I need to make an outlier for that to happen? And so this is what the influence map is looking at. So again, we just look at uh, use the function influence map and put the change points and our influence metric um, there. And this basically tells me uh, across the bottom is the original time index. And then up the side is which, which data point I have made an outlier. OK, so we have this kind of um, so the colored blobs are the original change point locations and the color is their stability reference. So what we can see um, kind of around 150 is that you see, actually, if you make time point 150 an outlier, then that's that's kind of the white band going through the middle. So 150 is, is an outlier, so we will have a change point either side of it, as, as we would expect to have, okay? So that's, that's as we expect, and so therefore you've got that white bit in the middle. You've got the dark blue kind of top and bottom, and that's where um, we have deleted. That's when the change point gets deleted. So if if I make a change, uh, sorry, if I make a data point uh, kind of anywhere from kind of 160 there or 130 to 160 sort of range, um, then that is going to delete my, if I make an outlier for any of those points, that's going to delete the change point at 150. Okay. And if you kind of plotted one of those that you would kind of see, okay, if I made a big outlier, that change point around that 150 um, st stage here, if you, if you kind of look at that, just doesn't make sense anymore, okay? And then you see that if just prior to that, if you make a change point to any of those just prior to that, then the, that change point to 150 moves rather than gets deleted. Um, and so that that's why we've got this kind of block of this pale um, brown, um, in there as, as well. So that's where the change point gets moved. Okay. So the interesting thing is that, that things above the diagonal are basically uh, things where um, your observation is affecting time points prior to the time point that you have made an outlier and things below the, below the diagonal are things that where um, if you make a change earlier, it is affecting things later. Okay. So that's kind of got an interesting interpretation there. But this is talking about, you know, where that instability comes from. Um, and depending on your application, this may or may not be of interest to you. So that, that's all for making an outlier. And um, so if we, if you remember, I said that makes it the most influential it could possibly be by putting it in its own segment. So what happens if we just delete that data point? Okay. What happens to the change point locations at that, at that stage? 
So we can do exactly the same as we've done before, what, what I've just showed you, except now we're going to do method equals delete. Okay. So previously where I, wherever I had x.inf.out, I'm now just going to have x.inf.del, and that's going to give me the deletion influence. So that's all I'm changing in all of these graphics. And again, this um, stability dashboard looks exactly the same, okay? Because the when I delete an observation, my uh, first change point doesn't move. I've still got the outlier, and my last change point either gets moved or deleted. So that's exactly the same as it was before. The differences come in how and what, what that happens. So first thing to note is that, is that the axis here goes from minus one to one. So it's basically much less of an effect than if you make an, out, an observation an outlier, okay? But if I delete an observation at time point 100, then because that was an outlier in the first place, I now delete um, one of my change points. So I expect I expect there to be changes um, just before and just after. And now I get a, a deletion because I've deleted that data point. And so when I delete a data point, I, um, I would expect that only one change point maximally can get deleted uh, when I delete a change when I delete an observation. So this here is coming from the fact that the original point is an outlier, which is something that is is um, kind of um, not something that is is necessarily expected with it within the time series, and so therefore I get a deletion of one. Similarly, when when I um, delete an observation um, at, at some Point, I get a, a deletion of the change point once at uh, around 150. And then there's there's a, a an additional change point once at some point um, that, that gives me a change point at a new location. Okay. So now looking at the parameter stability, it's much more stable because when you're deleting a data point, you're, you're not splitting a segment. So when you split a segment, you then get sm a smaller number of observations either side. When you make a point an outlier, smaller number of observations either side. So you get more instability in the mean structure. So here we're seeing a much cleaner plot coming through. And the um, interesting part is just before 150 on the bottom line. And this clearly is, a, is around a move of a change point as, as we kind of see on this one here. So we've got a move here and we've got a deletion. So clearly this, this mean structure here is coming from that move and, and deletion uh, coming through, but it's much cleaner from, a, um, from an inference point perspective. And again, the influence map that, that we can see here is, is again um, much cleaner than, than um, the um, outlier map. Um, and that just shows you that um, around the outlier location around 100, um, if you, delete um, one of the data points here at 100, then that means there's one less change point than we expect um, going for the rest of the data, because that goes all the way to the end. And then here we've got, um, if you uh, delete an observation around um, just before 150, then the change point moves earlier. That's the kind of brown line going um, um, to, to the left of the diagonal. That's kind of a, a short-lived effect because we have uh, the, the move comes through because um, we have an extra change point here. So for that period, we are not expecting to see a change point. So we have an extra change point, but then we expected to see one at, one at 150 and we didn't see one. So therefore now we are on the correct number of change points. So if we had an extra change point, so we had the change point at 150 and just prior to 150, then um, this line would be brown all the way to the end because that would signify an extra change point globally. Whereas segments of lines like, like we've got here indicate moves of change points. Okay. So does anybody have any questions at that point? Let me just grab the chat. Oh, uh, Jenny's asked, um, does the value chosen for the outlier matter? Uh, that is a good question. Um, so provided it is large enough to um, put it in its own segment, then it doesn't matter what that value is. And we have some theory that tells us how large it has to be relative to everything around it to put it in its own segment. 
But from a practical perspective, to save on computational time, uh, what we do is we add twice the range of the data um, because that definitely will put it in its own segment. Um, but within the code, um, there's options for you to be able to change that and you can have a look at, well, how much do I need to change for, for, that, to, for that to be put in its own segment? And that can be different for the different um, points across time as well. Good. Does anybody have, else have any other questions so far before I move on to multivariate? No. Multivariate is going to be our last topic today. Okay. So in everything that we've looked at so far, we've looked at univariate change points. That's where you just have one time series. So what's increasingly um, um, available to us is we might have multiple time series. Um, for example, within the NHS, you, you, know, you may have um, a and a &E admissions at multiple hospitals across a trust, or you could be looking across trusts, um, or you could be looking within individual departments, and you might be looking at, well, how does the behaviour, is it similar, is it different across um, different departments or different hospitals or different processes? Um, in all of that, you can um, have it can give rise to multivariate time series. Okay, and so lots of different things can happen when we move from univariate to multivariate time series in terms of of change points. So one thing that um, is maybe um, obvious but not necessarily obvious when you're in the thick of it um, is that if all of the time series are completely unconnected from each other then just using univariate change point analysis on each individual time series could be the best thing to do, okay? You don't expect any change points at, at the same locations and the, the time series are not correlated in any way, then, then that, that is the most appropriate thing to do. If that's not the case, and there is some straight shared structure across, um, I'm gonna call these different multivariate series channels, um, across the different channels or the different series, um, then a few things can happen. So one thing is that the change points could occur at the same time in all of the different series. And that um, often can be a, a very simple assumption to be able to make, but it's a very strong assumption to make. Okay. Um, the other thing that could happen is that, well, at different time points, maybe different subsets of the, the channels can change. So you may have, for example, in 2016, you may have, um, a subset of, of the departments um, had a new process put in place and therefore you've got a change point just in that subset of departments. And then maybe the change was um, rolled out later to a bunch to everybody. And so at some point in the future, well, the ones that have already changed are not going to change again. So you've got the other subset might be changing um, um, from that. Um, obviously, the changes occurring at the same time in all channels, big one for that is, is around COVID. You, you would have seen that was a shock that happened across many of, of the series. Um, um, and um, I'm not sure where, whether there would be one that, that um, didn't have, have some form of, of COVID um, effect coming through. So the interesting thing that you can get when you move to multivariate change points is that the nature of the change could be different in the different channels. So you could have one series where the response is a mean shift and another series where the response to the same type of change could be a trend shift or it could be just a change in variance. Um, and so there's interesting things and challenges that occur in multivariate time series that do not occur when, when you look at univariate time series. Okay. And these are just some examples of, of what could happen. There could be many more different things. So let me think about why do, why do we want to do multivariate change points, okay? So I've got a, a graphic at the bottom here, and this just shows me um, many, many different time series, but instead of plotting them um, with lines, I've chosen to plot them with colors. So the intensity of the color is kind of the value in the time series. So you can see you've got a, a darker block um, uh, kind of around here, um, between zero and 500, now you've got a darker block towards the bottom. And that says that, that they have a lower mean um, because of the key on the right-hand side says that darker blocks are closer to zero, lighter books are closer to one. 
And so we can visualize a change point here by looking at, well, is the coloring from the left to the right different? And I've, I've put in the um, line at 500 to kind of guide your eyes um, with that. And so if that's the case, then what, what is going to be a benefit to us? So if we're looking at any individual one of these time series, um, what would we see? So, for example, if, if we take the, the darker patch kind of um, from, you know, about 10% to, to about 40% from the bottom, uh, the dark patch on the left um, goes to a light patch on the right. Now, that is quite a stark change when you look at the, the colorings here, whether, whether it would seem as stark when you look at the actual values is, is another question because it's between zero and one uh, and would depend on the variance that, that we're seeing. Um, but certainly here, as, as it is depicted, we have a very dark patch to the left and a very light patch to the right. And so you would like to think that if you ran your um, univariate time series on any one of those series within that patch, that you'd be able to identify the change point, okay? Now, it becomes much harder when, when you're kind of looking at some of the others. So again, from, from kind of about 60% um, of the way up to, to about 90% um, of the way up, you've got a light patch on the left, goes to a darker one on the right. Again, that looks quite obvious as a, as a change. But if you say, look at, look at the top patch, kind of from 90% of the way up to, to the top of the graphic, looking from left to right, that is much harder to discern whether a change point exists there or not. Okay. Same for the patch around the middle of the graph. It's much harder to look from the left to the right. And the same for the patch at, at the kind of zero to 10% of the graph. Again, it's much harder to, to ascertain whether there's a change point there if we looked at each individual series by itself. Now, the advantage that we gain from looking from a multivariate perspective um, is that if we expect the change to kind of occur in all of the time series, then we can use the obvious changes from the other time series to help guide us to where the change points might be in the series that have a much smaller change. Okay. You can interpret that as a much smaller change or indeed a higher variance as well. Um, so the change size could be the same, but if the variance is much larger in, in the inner series, then it's much harder to identify where the change point is. And so that kind of gives you um, a benefit to looking multivariately in that we can incorporate this multivariate power that if we see a, a more obvious change in another series, then and we believe that the changes occur in all the series, then that, that will allow us to identify it more easily. The problem comes in the fact that we now have many, many time series here. And so computationally speaking, it's quite expensive to, to kind of look for these change points. Um, and also, if we relax that assumption of saying that the change point must occur in all the time series, um, it becomes much more computationally intensive to decide which, which series have change points and which don't. Okay, so just to kind of give you an idea of some um, well-known multivariate change point approaches, there's ECP, there's INSPECT, and then there's double QSUM, as I kind of already noted from um, some of the other R packages that are available. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, GeomCP, so this is in changepoint.geo package. And the reason why GeomCP is interesting is, uh, as opposed to these other methods um, that exist here, is that we can actually look for changes in multiple dimensions to the, um, um, of the original series. So whereby in the univariate time series, you're looking for changes in mean. So if you're looking for changes in mean, you would use the inspect algorithm. If you're looking for changes in variance, you might use the double QSUM algorithm. And um, for the um, GeomCP here, this is kind of the akin, this is akin to looking for changes in mean and variance. So ECP is kind of an exception because the ECP has, um, looks for a change in distribution, um, multivariate distribution, but it, it uses ranks and it's a non-parametric um, setup. So um, it's more tuned to looking for changes um, around the, the median of the data than it is to looking at the tails of the data. Um, but GeomCP, for example, um, the intuition here is that we want to look for um, both mean and variance shifts. 
So I've just done a, a two-dimensional depiction here, but you can imagine this going into kind of P dimensions. Um, uh, in two dimensions here, if, if we imagine that our original data is our black points here, so what does a mean shift look like? So a mean shift could be something like moving from the black cloud of points to the blue cloud of points, okay? And a variant shift would be moving kind of from the black cloud of points to the green cloud of points, as an example, okay? So how can we actually look and identify both of these? So if we, for example, looked just for mean change, change points, we, we wouldn't be able to identify the shift from the black to the green, because the mean is the same in both. But we want to be able to identify both mean and variance shifts together, not separately. So how can we do that? So John CP kind of takes this geometric interpretation and says, okay, well, if we have um, a, a graphic such as this one, how can we detect the shifts? So the way that we detect the shifts um, in a univariate context from a, a mean um, on a mean shift is, is we're essentially just positing that, that there would be a different mean at a different location. So we could potentially do that for all of, you know, look at a mean and variance shift for all of the potential P dimensions, but that would be very complicated and it would be very um, computationally intensive, especially as we look to, well, um, which are going to shift or not. So a lot of what these um, existing methods do is, is they look at projections. So a bit like you would do in principle, principle component analysis, you kind of would identify a principal direction to project your data into that kind of is along the axis of interest that, that you're looking at. So that's exactly what Inspect does. Um, it picks a projection direction and projects the data into a one dimensional space uh, to look for mean changes. What we're proposing to do here is to project this into a two dimensional space one that is going to be sensitive to mean changes and one that's going to be sensitive to variance changes. And a sensible um, two-dimensional space to kind of project this into is to kind of be using the idea of um, polar coordinates. So here, what, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at distances and angles. So if we look at the distances from the origin to all of the black points, um, then we will get a very a normal variability around um, the mean um, the mean distance from um, the origin to um, the mean of the black points. Similarly, if we then looked at kind of if if we had done all of the black points because that's in our first segment, and we then move to the blue points, that distance is going to be much larger. Okay, so we're then going to get a change in mean in the distance to our points. I should say at this point, um, we've clearly recentered all of our data here. So if some of our data was negative, um, then um, that would obviously skew this, this um, distance metric. So we've, we've basically ported all of our data from wherever it is on the axis into the top quadrant just by a transformation. So then that's kind of covering the um, mean change. How will we get the, the variance change coming out? So for that, what we do is, is we look at the angle. So we look at the principal angle um, from um, the uh, horizontal axis to all of these potential data points. So in the first segment, it's going to be the angle to all of the black points, where again, we would, we would see that um, they're all quite similar. And um, so they would all be around a, a mean angle and they would be very similar. Whereas when we move to the green points, they would... Um, the variance of that angle would increase, okay? Um, because we're, we're now going to a much wider set so that the um, set of angles that we're looking at would increase, okay? So that's kind of where the intuition is coming from. So if we, for example, take um, this uh, data set as an example, so um, this is just a matrix where we have um, 100 data sets um, of mean, uh, sorry, yeah, 100 times 20, because we have uh, 20 points here where, where we have, no, I've gone the other way. It's 20 time series where we have 100 points um, from just a standard normal distribution. And then here we are going to have um, 
10. So, sorry. We then have 10 of our columns here that have no change in mean. And then we're going to have 10 here where we have a change in mean to go from a mean of zero to a mean of one. Okay. So that's just setting this up. So this top right quadrant here has a change in mean going from mean of zero to a mean of one. And if you kind of, as soon as you know that, you can kind of squint your eyes a little bit and you can see that, that the um, mean, the kind of the color in that top right quadrant is darker than the, the or the average color is darker than everywhere else. Okay, so that's just how we're setting up our data. And so if we then take these angles and distances that, that we were talking about, uh, if we look at the distance, which is the bottom graphic here, um, you can see that we have a mean distance and then we shift to another mean distance when we have that change in mean. And so even though it's only half of our data points here that are changing, um, we still get um, a change in mean here. I should say the, the assumption of this projection, as in all projection metrics, is that the change is in all of the time series. Okay. Um, and then we do the same thing with the angle measure. So we've got um, a variability around um, the angle measure, and then that jumps to a different um, angle measure, um, a, a different mean angle measure um, after the change point. So the changes that we see in the mean structure can be seen in both the distance and the angle, um, and the um, both. So if you then run change point detection on this two-dimensional space, which is a lot um, more reduced than the uh, we, we were using here, twenty-dimensional space, but um, you can you know potentially could be hundreds or thousands down to two dimensions. Um, you can just run change point detection independently on these two and identify where the change points are. And in this instance, they come at the same location. So this is a mean and variance example now. So we've now got again got a twenty um, time series here. First hundred are just the same standard normal distribution. But then the next 100, we're going to have 10 of them with um, just a change in mean and 10 here with a mean and variance change. Um, now let's see what, what goes on here. So again, we've got a mean and variance change. So um, we expect to see the mean change in the distance, but we don't expect to see the variance change there, whereas the variance change is going to be coming up in the angle. But that also does um, often pick up a mean change as well. Okay. And again, for this example, uh, both the angle and the distance come up with the change points at the same location. So I've got a little task for you for you now, and um, this is going to be the final one of today. And um, so we have this data here, which is the ACGH uh, bladder tumor data. It's from the ECP package. So if you library ECP and then do data ACGH, that, that will um, make that available to you. And so this is 43 patients, and each has 2,215 uh, observations, which is uh, genomic data um, for each of these patients that have bladder tumors. So the motivation here is that if we can find change points that are common across patients, this might help us um, in um, both identifying uh, bladder tumors um, from a uh, genomics perspective, but also in treatments and, and trying to help us identify which um, treatments might be most appropriate as to which ones can target those specific genomes. Okay, so I'm going to leave you for, for a minute. I'd like you to uh, look at the JOMCP here. So the JOMCP package is very simple. You can just do JOMCP on the data Y and then just do plot um, to plot the results, which will give you the distance and the angle measures. Um, so again, I think we'll do... Um, 10 minutes first, so we'll come back at um, 11.45. Did people manage to, to fit this? Do you want to unmute or, or let me know in the chat? What did you find? Hi, Rebecca. Um, I managed to um, do something, <laughs> but um, I don't know. I, I I got an image that had lots of um, lots of uh, change points for both the mean and uh, the or the 
the distance and the angle sorry so yeah. um I don't know how um but I, I I'm still working on it so I don't know what we were then meant to do with the with the results so I'm just kind of having having another look through that no that's good so well th thank you for letting me know so um yeah I mean we can kind of see from this image can't we and um, just from looking at the data there's lots of blocks where some um, of the series, you've got to remember this is 43 now, not the 20 that we were looking at before. So you can see lots of blocks where they have a, maybe a lighter patch of colour or a darker patch of colour, but that some of them look like they may coincide. Like uh, you've got a, a kind of a block uh, just before point two um, here where you can kind of see that there are several with a lighter patch um, that might be interesting from, from a, a, a perspective um, of looking for for um, uh, looking at genes that, that might be contributing um, or active um, when we're looking at bladder tumor patients. There's also kind of a chunk at, uh, towards the end where you also have kind of a lighter patch. Um, but it's one of those where I, I fully agree with you. Um, it's not especially clear. And and what what I like about this example is is that it can give us an indication um, of of what where we might want to look. But in reality, the real question that we really want to answer here is not just where, where are the changes that occur in all the patients, but actually we want to know where are the change points that occur in most of the patients. So really, we really we, the question that we're really asking by doing this analysis is we're really kind of doing, um, in my opinion, the, the wrong analysis on this data because we don't just want to know assume the change points are in all of the time series and find where they are. What's really interesting for, for this type of problem is we want to know, well, where are the change points where the majority of the times of the patients see a change? Because they're the ones that we really want to target most for, for when we're looking for treatments. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting. So this is the solution that you may have got. Um, lots of change points, as you might see. Um, it's not as clear as, as the simulator data that we were looking at previously, is it? There's, there's lots of up and down points and you're kind of looking in this middle part here where you're saying, well, there looks to be something going on, but it's not finding any change points in, in that angle measure. And so it could be interesting in terms of, well, what, what's going on with the data there? Why, why is it that um, we're seeing lots of changes elsewhere, but, but not in that bit? Whereas when you're looking kind of um, around 1750, um, on the, the kind of both of the measures, you've got a portion there where you've got no change points again, but you might be looking at that going, okay, yeah, I, I can I can believe that. Um, so yeah, so, so I find that there's a lot of stuff going on here. And I think one of the key points is that assumption of all the series changing, which is, um, in my opinion, um, certainly not valid um, in this in this data set, and also not interesting from, from a, a, an analysis point of view. Um, and I will leave it at that for today. We, we, we currently have a, a paper in submission around um, identifying where the, you know, which data points would be changing um, in, in that context. So maybe that's one for me to include um, in next year's um, further change point workshop. So one of the key things here is around um, the decision of um, how many change points might be appropriate. And again, we've, we've got this, um, autocorrelation that, that may be going on um, in, in this in this data set. So if we want to look at maybe trying to highlight the ones that are most indicative of, of um, um, change points that might be in the majority of patients, then we can have a look at this um, um, kind of uh, elbow plot here to try and decide, well, which, which change points are going to be the most beneficial. And if you look off to the, to the left of this graphic, there's quite a number of change points at the beginning where as you add those change points, you get a huge decrease in, in the test statistic and um, kind of a, around down to the difference in test statistic of around 60. Then you start to get a, a larger portion that are more, more slowly contributing. And then you get more towards that elbow where, where you're then after that is, is definitely something that's not interesting. Um, from a, a, a diagnostic point of view. So this, this type of plot you can get just by um, looking at um, the 
uh, so the distance measure here so you can just use the distance function or you can use the angle function to get just the distance or just the angle out and then you can do that and um, repeat the analysis that's done automatically in in the uh, geomcp function um, which basically just um, analyzes issues in cft mean var and then you can use the crops function as i have done here that we spoke about in the um, original um, um, workshop and then i've just put five to one hundred uh, sorry, five to 500 here is the, the different penalties. And this is how I get my di uh, diagnostic plot coming out. Um, so yes, yeah, so just to kind of summarize um, on that part, um, multivariate um, change points are, is an interesting area. There's still lots of challenging challenges in the univariate space, as I was talking about with autocorrelation and things earlier, um, as well as other things like irregular data and, and more complicated model structures, including um, um, seasonality and, and other things within your modeling um, but multivariate is an interesting space where there's a lot of work going on at the moment um, and in general um, obviously hopefully some of these more complicated issues that we've discussed today might have piqued your, your interest a little bit so if you do have a problem that um, you know you want you think change points might be appropriate for and you haven't um, found a solution in, in what I've um, um, discussed both in the first workshop and, and in this workshop, please do reach out to me because there's a lot of different um, methods out there that, that already exist that I haven't had time to cover today. So it could be that I can just point you to one of those or, or equally it could be something interesting that we don't have a solution for yet. And, and in which case we can maybe work together um, and come up with, with a, a way of uh, providing a solution to your problem. Equally, if um, you think, yes, no, it is something that we've um, covered and you're not entirely sure how to how to apply what you've seen or want any general types of help or guidance as to how to interpret things or anything like that, please do reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to help people who want to um, apply change points in, in whatever setting they're in. Um, so I suppose that just comes for me to kind of summarize for today and um, so each of these um, links to the original papers and um, if you want to read more about the methodology behind uh, the methods that we're kind of looking at so there's links um, in these to the uh, original papers for, for you to take a look at and as you can see John CP was uh, published last year and influences is brand new out and um, it got accepted um, last month so um, these are kind of hot topics that, that we're looking at at the moment. Um, does anybody have any questions before we finish for today? Oh, we've got some in the chat. Um, oh, no, Lucy. I'm glad you found it interesting, Lucy. Thank you. Um, are the papers on archive? Um, some of them are, but all of the ones that I do are either open source or are available on my website. So if you have any problems with my papers, then... Um, just head to my website, there will be an open source, uh, kind of a equivalent of an archive version. Um, if you've got problems with any of the other papers, then again, look on the author's websites. And if not, you can probably contact them directly and they will usually send you a, an early copy if it's not on archive. Um, yes. Oh, thank you, Jenny, for saying that I make things clear. Um, as I say, um, I think Charlotte will probably stop the recording now. And then if there is any questions you want to ask, about anything specific, then feel free to 